All right, I think I might just start. Is that okay? So welcome colleagues. Um, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And thank you particularly to our speaker, Dr. Su Ming Ku. We'll be talking about topics and dilemma that we are trying to work around in our scholarship and practice of higher education. Her topic is called sustainability, transdisciplinarity and the public epistemic role of higher education. Um, when I asked Sue if there were bits of insights into the background of her journey to the topics that we're discussing today, such as sustainability, interdi interdisciplinarity, reason, creativity, or even just the overall interest to study critically the way that we write and think about and represent change in the university. She wrote back, <laughs> busy as anything, describing the many classes that she had that week, many ideas that she was bouncing around and said that she would say that her interest could simply be described as sociological, an interest in what higher education can do to sustain society in different times and reflecting on development's connection to education and knowledge. So um, I thought I'd add a little bit about, a little bit of a story about how we connected, partly because this is a relatively new network and some of you may be wondering about how it came to be, but also just to show some of the ad hoc nature, sort of luck pushing that makes things happen. Because we are very much hoping that similarly you would consider some of the people you know, um, perhaps through their practice or thinking or scholarship, and maybe that you consider using this network as a way to connect. You'll see on our website, in fact, that we have links to conceptual notes to invite you to contribute to the network. And it includes in those conceptual notes the why and the how to do so. And some of that includes seminars that you may want to propose, um, or organize from your institution in partnership with the network. We're really open to that. That may even include scholars who you haven't yet had a chance to engage with, but you'd love to speak with you. Um, we could help organize that or maybe include your reflective blog po posts or podcasts about a paper or book you've written or a project that you're bringing into shape. Or even some sort of important issue or policy or event that is burning in your mind about higher education and its challenges of transforming. So the story that I'll tell you about um, was how I came to know Sue and how she responded with grace, thank you, to becoming an important part of this network. Um, so I arrived in Belfast in April, 2017 from South Africa and looking around at the ways in which I could contribute here and be part of something or if need be create a network from where I, from where I was in Belfast. Um, you know, Northern Ireland is a region that is separated from the Republic of Ireland and has quite a troubled history that continues in various ways in the present. So one of the important things for me was not to stay within the border thinking and schooling. So what I was trying to say is what was really important for me wasn't to stay schooled within the thinking of Northern Ireland as a border separate from the rest of the Republic of Ireland and not to just keep looking at the UK for solutions or only being invested in South Africa. Um, in a sense, doing so would stay within the sort of invisible delineations and, and borders that limit our thinking. I know that's one of the concerns of Michael's, you know, of, you know one of our founders. Um, so higher education studies not being an established area of research on this island, I spent a lot of time trolling through the websites um, until I found this one single page about a single event, which was an attempt to establish a network called Critical Higher Education Studies. And I literally cold called and was responded to by Sue. So, Fast forward two years, and then when Andre, that is Andre Kiet, who's here in this picture, who um, some of you may know from Nelson Mandela University, when he was coming to visit, um, we made some changes because of a sociological conference that was being hosted at Sue's University, and we adjusted plans for Andre's visit. So there he is at the university that I am at, Queen's University, and Andre and I then drove six hours to this charming little town on the west coast of Ireland called Galway. Sorry, I only seem to have 
Twitter pics as records. Um, and what we found there was that Sue was central to a very different type of conference, a different vibe, a way of welcoming divergent thoughts and um, scholarship. Andre and I were complete outsiders. <clears throat> in fact, it's the first time I've ever been part of a sociological organization because my background is in arts and in cultural studies. And we each presented, the three of us, about the importance of the critical study of higher education as a sort of invitation to those who were there. It was the very first time we had ever met, spoken together or presented. Um, and watching you, Sue, was fascinating. Watching you talk, move between people and their thoughts. You, I remember at some point, Andre and I spoke and said, wow, this woman, this woman just makes these leaps and connections around disciplines and ways of doing things and pushes things and also works really, really hard. Um, so we were very, very impressed. Um, and that led to Sue's invitation to join us at the Winter School um, that was part of the establishing of this network in 2019 at Nelson Mandela University. And here she is in this photo presenting on emancipation and asking whether it should be about rebellion or repair. And the link for that recording is on our website. Um, and she's continued to be involved as a contributor. She has written a blog post, participated in gatherings. And the screen print, in fact, is from her presentation earlier this year about all the insights, investments, and pedagogies that she feels are related to transdisciplinary courage. And she was arguing then that that has importance for the critical study of the university. So this leads us to today. And the real treat of listening to Sue speaking about those concerns, which she believes that we should deliberate and analyze. I'll hand over to, to Kama now to more formally introduce Sue, but just to remind you to raise questions and put on <coughs> comments in the chat um, for the period after Sue's talk, when we'll engage more interactively. Also, this talk is being recorded and will be uploaded to the ACAS Africa website. So that's at www.acasafrica.com. You're very welcome to subscribe there for more information about events and news as it progresses. If you use social media to share from this talk, please use the hashtag ACUSAfrica with A-C-U-S-A -S in capitals. So thank you, everybody. Welcome again, and over to you, Pamela. All right, uh, thank you, Dina, for that uh, warm welcome. My name is Kamano Veven. I'm a research assistant um, and a professor Andre Kitt at the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation at Nelson Mandela University. Okay, now let's get to introducing our speaker. Um, Su Ming Ku is a senior lecturer in political science and sociology and leads the so socioeconomic impact at Ryan Institute and Environment Development and Sustainability at Whitaker Institute Research Clusters at NUI Galway. She researches and teaches on human rights, human development, public goods, development alternatives, decoloniality, global activism, development education, and higher education. She is the principal investigator of a study called Building Collaborative Approaches to University Strategies Against Exclusion in Ireland and Africa, Pedagogies for Quality Higher Education and Inclusive Global Citizenship. She is the co-editor with Helen Cara of research, Researching in the Age of COVID-19, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, which is published by the Policy Press and Qualitative and Digital Research in Times of Crisis, which is published by Bristol University Press. So over to you, Sue. So thank you so much, Karma and Dina. Thank you so, so much for such a lovely um, introduction. Now, can you see the right screen? Yes. Just some, okay, good. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to launch into it and um, we really don't need to say much more except for, you know, a few points that, you know, I'm going to raise because it's quite a broad ranging talk um, and I hope it's going to 
cover some things of interest to different people in the network. So uh, transdisciplinarity is a general theme, and then considering this, this public epistemic role of higher education, the role, the knowledge role of higher education in sustainability transformations. So just drawing on that response that um, I gave the short, rather curt response, because I'm very busy, gave to uh, Dina. Um, the sociological response to what higher education can do to help to sustain society in difficult times, because there is no doubt that these are uh, difficult times. And it's in these times then that we are looking to higher education as a public site to, to, to challenge um, what is not changing in what you might call an omni crisis. Yeah, it's so many different crises. It's not just the pandemic crisis, but so many crises. And, and to engage in critical reflexivity and dream about transformation. And so this, this pandemic that, we, that has been with us now for over a year and a half really exemplifies the kind of thing that transdisciplinary science is trying to address. And that is the wickedness of societal problems. And wickedness mean, not meaning that the problems are just about evil, but the problems are wicked when the different people think that the problems are different and they have different answers. So they have different questions and different answers. This is what makes the problems wicked. But in and amidst all this wickedness and complexity and pandemic and omni crises, the big questions are these three for, for higher education, I think. And I'm following some uh, really good publications that have been uh, uh, made by uh, uh, big group of academics to think about the future of higher education in these difficult times. And these are the questions of democracy, of equity, and uh, academic freedom. What's the role of that? What does it really mean? And in an omni crisis, in a, a, a situation like we, that that we're facing today, there's always this kind of danger that, uh, you know, we are not facing the problems with the, the, the amount of urgency that is needed, because it is undoubtedly the case that urgency is needed because we need, yeah, uh, this is what the International Panel on Climate Change says, rapid, far-ranging, unprecedented changes to all aspects of our society, because as the UN uh, uh, DG has said, it's a code red for humanity. So, you know, we can't be just fiddling with some theory of transdisciplinarity when it's in this situation of, of utmost urgency. But urgency itself is also a form of entrapment. So this book that I have with Helen Carr that I've edited um, on doing research in times of crisis um, draws this connection between this, this fast omni crisis that is just uh, hitting us in waves and waves and, 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 and we are feeling it with such intensity. But really the, the, the fast crisis or the new crisis is really accentuating pre-existing and underlying, underlying slow crises. The ones that we, we actually recognize because they're so familiar, but they're crises nevertheless. And these are the crises of inequity, injustice, and harm. So there's always this trap that urgency can make us think that, oh, it's about the unprecedented thing and forget about the slow thing that's already there. And this can actually lead to more harm. So I really like this concept that indigenous North American uh, um, a writer called Carl Poes White uh, uh, writes about, which is ag being against what he calls crisis epistemology. A crisis epistemology is when there's this, this kind of sudden urgency that actually leads people to neglect the real slow crises that are still ongoing. And that neglect leads to even more harm and injustice and compounds harm and injustice. And so White says what you need, you know, what, what uh, uh, people in, in disadvantaged position need 
uh, what people who have already suffered from injustice need is what he calls an epistemology of coordination. And I love this concept. So I want to put this concept together, the epistemology of coordination against crisis epistemology with transdisciplinarity and the ambitions and desires of trans the transdisciplinary science. So transdisciplinary science comes about because there is a crisis of knowledge. Yeah, because normal knowledge or normal science is not really kind of working anymore. It's in crisis. And that actually leads to the demand for interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, cross interdisciplinarity, and transdisciplinarity. It leads to this demand for science to be more engaged because the disciplines themselves um, are not sustainable disciplinary, traditional, conventional scientific knowledge is somehow unsustainable or shouldn't be sustained. And the reason why is not really because of the disciplines themselves, but because they've been challenged by uh, both inside and outside um, the critiques of the exclusions and inequities of the way that conventional disciplines have organized knowledge. So the feminist, the decolonial, the anti-racist challenge, these have all, these are part of the challenge of post-normal science. So part of what I want to do today then is to answer some of the challenges that come with this post-normal situation. Uh, because when science is no longer normal, when it's no longer conventional or traditional, what you have is the undermining of the authority, the traditional authority of science, of the, the authority of the epistemic arrangement, as you might say, or the epistemic contract or settlement. But this can lead to uh, exciting new times when there's going, there's going to be, let's say, uh, a lot more different ways of seeing things, doing things, creativity, participation. But there's also more relativism that there are different perspectives. And we can get caught by this uh, proliferation of difference, which can lead to a kind of crisis of values and a crisis of consensus and a crisis of knowing what we should hold on to. And this, of course, is a very sociological problem because it can lead to people becoming unmoored in the world, yeah? Really not being sustained by their society and feeling that you know, there's this knowledge, that knowledge, the other knowledge, one, no knowledge is better than the other knowledge, that, you know, there's alternative facts, alternative truths, alternative sciences, and this can lead to nihilism, yeah, there's, you know, nothing is better than another, nothing is truer than another thing. And the trap that this pushes people into is a completely instrumental approach to knowledge. So since it doesn't matter whether it's true or not, uh, you're just going to use the science to advance, not knowledge itself, but your own personal or political interests or your sectional or identitarian personal or political interests. So this is not, not is knowledge is no longer for its own sake, but knowledge is just something, a tool that can be used for the sake of anything else. And so this is the problem of epistemic cynicism. So, a crisis epistemology can combine with nihilism and cynicism. And what we need to do today, I think, to not become completely unmoored and unsettled and un unhomely is to begin to reach towards some position of epistemic responsibility, which is this epistemology of coordination. So I don't want you to look at all of this ridiculous table, which is obviously too much information, but I just want you to note that there's these two types of mode one is the normal science at the top left, right? And mode two is whatever is after the normal, post-normal, different science, transdisciplinary science, interdisciplinary science, some science for society, for problems, for the situation. And then there's these different categories of, you know, the disciplines, multidisciplines, something that you might do between them called interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, something that's beyond just interdisciplinarity, but is reaching towards something different. 
And just in the bottom right hand cells, you can see the, that there are these different, sorry, they're looking at the columns that the, from left to right, there's these different directions that this trans inter or trans or multi inter trans disciplinarity can go. One is reduction. So everything is going into one direction towards one discipline, one perspective, one problem, one approach, one method, that's reduction. Or there's some sort of convergence or consilience where each discipline or can contribute something, maybe can even go towards a new synthesis, or if it becomes transdisciplinary, you know, go towards some sort of co-production, collective learning, new type of target knowledge or values, develop concepts that can go across the differences and maybe even transform knowledge. So these are all the, um, what I call the transdisciplinary C type of, you know, transdisciplinarities happening with convergence. But I also want to talk about divergence because divergence is when transdisciplinarity and, and adding more perspectives and people is actually diversifying the dialogue to a poly and making it more like a polylogue. By polylogue or beyond a dialogue, there is this special transdisciplinary concept, which is called the concept of the included middle. Okay, it's sort of got everything, everything is kind of allowed or possible in this particular principle. And you know that something is transdisciplinary when it has this principle of the included middle as a way of dealing with divergence and difference. Because even though there's divergence, even though there's difference, it's possibility that there's still something in the middle that can be included. But part of that included middle requires rendering the negative spaces, the things that have been made invisible visible by questioning epistemic privileges by questioning you know, epistemic dominance. So divergence is often a little bit kind of, you know, difficult questioning, pushing back. And then there's the really woo woo category and that's emergence. So that's when you get um, really transformative knowledge, a different attitude towards science that's always questioning itself and renewing itself through its own self-questioning, leading it into a kind of open-ended learning process, which accepts that we don't have one single answer, but that we will need some kind of pluriversal coexistence. And this also means coexistence of not only the rational, conventional, scientific mode, but also different relational modes, which are about how we deal with otherness and other people, other values, other things, and, and, and relate to them. Now, I don't want to talk about transdisciplinarity as if only it, the, it's the good transdisciplinarity that we are interested in, and that is a transdisciplinarity that hasn't happened yet. Because I think that what we are trying to do today is public scholarship in a situation where a kind of transdisciplinarity has already quite successfully happened. So you, I could call this termite transdisciplinarity. I've, I've called it termite neoliberalism in the slide because that's the sort of transdisciplinarity I'm talking about. That neoliberalism has already managed to permeate all the disciplines and to transform them from within and without and to challenge them from within and without and actually change the way we live our lives and do our work in our institutions. And so just think about the sound of thousands and millions of tiny termites munching away at the structure of that we inhabit the institutional structure that we inhabit. And this challenges and changes the different facets of public scholarship with in, in the area of research, you know, it brings in this rating path of funding and competition and metrics and bureaucracy. And this hollows out and eats away at 
the independent and critical role of research, our ability to give valid and reliable and impartial evidence and academic with academic freedom. Yeah, it affects engagement by calling us to engage and calling us to be more relevant and so on. And the government's then saying, you know, we control the food bowls. We will move your food bowls around until you do what we want. But then of course, it's not evidence informing policy. It's government selecting evidence or hiding evidence that may not be convenient or, or, or fitting with their particular policies. And this eats away at what Bonnie, Bonnie Honig calls you know, the, the holding environment for a democracy, because what we do in our work is something that provides an environment for democracy to kind of exist, become and grow up. It affects our teaching because now we are educating not for the public and democratic world, but for the neoliberal subjectivity of human capital and competition. And these all impact on the key transdisciplinary concern with integration, which really rests on the impossibility of value neutrality, because it raises this question of which knowledges, which norms, which values should we choose? And integration is not the same as integrity. Integration is not the same as justice. But I just want to raise this, yeah, this, 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 put these two words together, integration and integrity. So they're not exactly the same, but perhaps, you know, integrity has something to bring to this unfinished problem of integration. So that's the first column of my intertransdisciplinarity uh, typology table is this, this tendency to reduction and this trans, transdisciplinary neoliberal trend has um, injected this whole comp competitive and also authoritarian tendency into our everyday life, flooding our lives with what Wilson calls the metric tide. You know, when we are born along by the metric tide, we are, we are, we are, we are pushed for competitive excellence. But my Because project with Paul Prinsloo, you know, is trying to show that ex excellence in, seen in this competitive frame is not the same as quality, yeah? Quality and excellence are not the same thing. That quality can have other meanings. Quality may refer to integrity, which has diverse qualities that is more hospitable, and convivial in terms of its epistemic attitude and contribution. So we are pushed to have more impact and so on, but all the meta studies that are coming out show us that this, we're not having evidence-based policy. We have policy-driven evidence, government in power exercising normative and cognitive selectivity. They only select the studies, they commission what they want, and when what they've commissioned doesn't say what they want to hear, then they ignore it, and worse still, they ignore it and blame the scholars that they have commissioned to do it for not doing the right thing or not doing it properly. And literally, you know, just gaslighting academia and research. So, you know, we come back, I think, the sociologist, the great sociologist Durkheim, um, has this, you know, this, this, this ideal of what could be translated into English as public opinion, but it wouldn't sound right today because public opinion has become, um, I suppose, you know, transdisciplinarily and uh, eaten by termites. You know, public opinion has been permeated by, by market research and marketing. And so that's what we think public opinion is now, not this um, this, this, this formation of a public conscience, a collective conscience, a collective value base, deciding what the society is about and what the identity of the society is, right? So public opinion is not the same as authority. Public opinion is not the same as the collective, you know, what the collective uh, determines to be authoritative. 
And this is the sign of the times that we have declining trust. We have alternative facts in Kellyanne Conway's uh, formulation. We have post-truth and this Trumpism and, and, and political lying in, in, in coming to the fore. And part of the problem today is also that we can no longer assume that um, higher education is what people really want or people really trust. If you look at the US, which I know is um, kind of extreme uh, uh, example, the US Pew surveys that shows that uh, um, uh, somewhere between half and two thirds of Republican leaning uh, uh, people in the US think that universities are actually have a negative effect on the country. Though in very contradictorily, they also believe that they, they, are, they are good for preparing people for the job market and they do have value in that respect, but still that they have a negative effect on the country. So how can universities and higher education be critically conducting transformative transdisciplinary research, you know, that's going to somehow help society in difficult circumstances if, if universities think this? And um, the political theorist Bonnie Honig uh, puts this down to something that she calls cultural cognition, which is really a, a, a scenario of political polarization, where the cultural value or the cultural valuation or evaluation reflects a certain kind of political culture of oppositional identification, yeah, it's over identification. It's not that, you know, it, that it really reflects different cultures as such, yeah? So just to go from reduction to convergence for a minute and think, you know, from to redirect from kind of the wrong direction that's been going to maybe a more hopeful direction and where we might put universities for the public good in this picture, which would have the public mission or national or global public goods as um, an objective for collaboration, for inter-transdisciplinary work, yeah, that we are oriented towards, you know, doing, creating something that's going to be helpful, or at least going towards something that's going to be sustaining for society in difficult times. And we recently, uh, last year, had a, a big conversation about this in Ireland on you know, the transformation that's needed for uh, universities uh, hosted by the Irish Universities uh, Association. And they brought uh, 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 you know, very important experts to talk about this. And the transformation then was, was you know, to transform the system from some combination of a, a state-driven instrument to some kind of a market-like service company towards something that might be thought of as a republic of science, a democratic scientific knowledge republic, yeah? And in this then, um, you can see there's some hope for a public and democratic science that's oriented towards this opening of science. So in the public tradition of open science or the public uh, school of open science, uh, it means um, bringing the public to collaborate in the science that we do. And also, so that's in the creation of knowledge, but also democratizing access to the knowledge that has been created. I also think we need much better conceptions of public goods in order to make the argument for the public mission of universities for the public good. And I've uh, put drawn on global public goods theory to create a sort of a simple and po to popularize a sort of simple paradigm of new public goods theory, which basically has three aspects to it democratic participation equitable enjoyment of goods, and then this, this, this corner that's called public benefit, which is really about harm reduction and benefit and beneficence and non-maleficence, so ethical principles, yeah? Because so, you don't want people to be democratically participating and, and equitably sharing in goods that are harmful. 
So that's you know, a way of thinking about public goods, but also thinking about higher education as a space for public life and how we look after that and sustain that because it has a sustaining role as what Honig calls the holding environment for democracy. She has this very fascinating um, theory that she derives from a combination of Hannah Arendt's theory of uh, the public world and public action and uh, uh, D.W. Winnicott's theory of uh, psychological development, which is that we need certain things to be there in the background and not be destroyed, even if when we have a sort of a childish tantrum and, and kind of try to throw them away, but we need them to still be there and not get destroyed to reassure us that the world is still somehow going to work. And public life needs that holding environment, she calls it, yeah? So all these ideas that I'm trying to bring to this question about integration, what are we doing when we're integrating knowledge across disciplines, between disciplines, and towards new convergent or divergent or emergent possibilities? And I'd like to bring back, I think, the values question. And you know, what do we have in academia in higher education to help us with this question of values. And of course, these are the values and principles of academic integrity. But integrity, integration can't do their work without thinking about where the demand for interdisciplinarity came from in the first place. And it really, if you're to understand the, the, the social history of contestation and of the debates. They've come from intersectional demands for social justice, from the feminists, from the critical race theorists, and from the decolonial theorists. So we want to bring transdisciplinarity to a higher level of understanding. Yeah. So at the very kind of first big conference that discussed this possibility of uh, transdisciplinarity. The main figures, founding figures of transdisciplinary theory, uh, Jean Piaget and Jansch, they talked about this necessity for integration with, with different and, and, and numerous connections, not just connecting together, but bringing us to a different place. So Piaget calls this a, a, a higher level of understanding that nevertheless is an absence of hierarchies. So it's a little bit contradictory, a higher level of understanding, but yet with an absence of hierarchy. So these numerous interconnections bringing us to a different place from the place that is determined and shaped by hierarchies, yeah? So Jansch says, you know, well, Piaget's idea is great, but you know, what about all this difference, all this divergence? You know, it's got to be, overcome with a concept of integration that achieves some sort of a higher purpose. And the higher purpose does not just reveal itself objectively just like that. So if you look at all the literature on scientific synthesis, scientific integration, there's quite a strong evidence for critique here yeah? because the scientific synthesis and scientific integration alone tends to be apolitical and indeed conservative and actually obscures the real demands for social justice that actually pushed inter and transdisciplinarity forward in the first place. Because inter and transdisciplinarity um, are trends that came out of student protests in the 1960s that are mirrored again in this spiral of, of, of contestation uh, in, in the, the later experiences and radical uh, protests in South Africa since 2015-16. It's sort of coming back again in another guise. Yeah. So Park and Samantri, argue that it's radical politics that were really the breeding ground for real interdisciplinary programs. This is where interdisciplinary research, interdisciplinary arguments, interdisciplinary con conversations, that's where these were born and that's where they grew up. So we should never forget the insurgent roots of interdisciplinarity. And indeed they're the same roots that are there in critical race theory. 
there are the intersectional struggles for inclusion and equity. It's a fantastic uh, podcast by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, big conversation with the veterans and, and, and the generations that have come since the original struggles of the 1960s for different um, excluded epistemes and populations uh, for inclusion and equity in the scientific episteme. So the alternative to a reductive competitive ratings path and metrics tied are disciplinary crossing and collaboration. Using disciplines, you know, as what Luke Craven calls boundary objects. Yeah, this is also uh, Star and Griezmann use this, this concept of the boundary object. So the discipline is not a religion, yeah? It's just a boundary object. It's a thing that can be used by different people in different ways if they want to collaborate across those boundaries. So a boundary object is kind of like a container of, organ, of information and you can take things out of the container and you can push the container around. So what do we mean by using it differently? Well, theorizing differently, doing our practice differently, approaching our data differently through these new modes of creating together, producing together, conversing together, arguing with each other, uh, educating each other through dialogue and polylogue, trying new ways of thinking about the problem, different formulations of the problem, different analyses to try and advance towards the sustainability goals. This is not easy work. It's extremely difficult. And I see in the audience, we have one of my colleagues, Mike Hogan, who's one of the most skilled facilitators I've ever seen. And this is the kind of people and skills that we need for dialogue, polylogue, pedagogies of transformation and learning for transformation. This, these, this type of dialogue, pedagogies for transformation, learning, they, they cannot take place unless we address ethics in a non tick box way. So uh, we could call this ethics all the way down. It's not just the institutional institutional review board of ethics application and filling in the application and getting your ethics clearance. It's about ethics as permeating everything that we do in our research, our teaching, our relationships with people and moving towards much more reflexive and democratic methods and, and practices connecting our thinking and our doing. Yeah, I like this, this word that Brown has coins, methics, methods and ethics. And these methods are not only about research, I think they are about pedagogies. They're about how we teach people and how we learn and how we teach ourselves and teach each other and, and learn. And I don't think that we can have the luxury of value neutrality. I think value neutrality is impossible and undesirable if we are interested in social sustainability. So back to the sociological question, the sustainability is not just about ecology and the planetary boundaries, though of course we have nothing else but those to face. It's not only about somehow having an economy that works. It is about, yeah, the question of society, the sociological question of the imaginary of society and higher education as this kind of microcosm and also uh, the hosting ground for this sustainability that we want to see potentially a sustainability to come. This can only be a sustainability to come, a social sustainability that comes through this epistemology of coordination this learning we have from the First Nations questions about the episteme, which redress the carelessness of our current epistemic cynicism and epistemically nihilistic and cynical situation. Yeah, because that's the problem about nihilism. That's the problem about cynicism is when the effects of them happen and nobody cares. So, this is really where intersectionality and the intersectional arguments have to come to the fore. And where also in our everyday practice, we need to you know, develop and, and cultivate and sustain professional solidarity because our life world is being permeated by harm, inequity and precarity. And this is what I mean by difficult times. 
So starting to gesture towards emergence. But firstly, I like to remind us that if we want to really invest in a higher education mission, that's mission driven. We should not forget what is central to the mission of higher education. And these are the higher and the educational aspects of higher education. And this is really the epistemic responsibility and social responsibility that I'd like to raise with us this group today and to talk about today. Um, what do we mean social responsibility? Yeah, uh, why, and what, what does it really look like in higher education? Because higher education has very specific aspects that are protected by academic freedom. This freedom to teach and learn, freedom from uh, 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 political interference, uh, uh, freedom, what is that, what does it mean, this freedom and how does it come about? This is a, a kind of a contradictory freedom and a freedom that comes out of contradiction through the ability to internally criticize our own thinking, to practice reflexivity, to struggle with our own selves around our values, our community, our conceptions and identifications, our commitments and our complicities. So these relate to this educative element which connects to the publicity of what we do as academics in public educational institutions, through our teaching, through our discourse, through our engagement with the world, we have some deep responsibility to the world. And part of that responsibility concerns the conduct and fostering of thinking that you know, this thinking is not, is not an element that we can dispense with. It is an indispensable element to our educative and scientific work, a central element to think for ourselves, to be able to think, to never be in the place of not thinking. And this is the thing that is protected by institutional autonomy and academic freedom, to guard the space, safe space where thinking can take place through the expression of different political and philosophical views, but in a way that is separated from the full proper world of politics. I love the way the educational philosopher Gert Biester uh, uh, describes uh, the educational world, the educational space as a space that he says is closed to society, but open to the world. So the educative element of higher education, despite having this deep sense of public and social responsibility, also has this aspect of being closed to society for educational reasons in order to open people to the world. We must have educational freedom, which includes the freedom to be wrong, the freedom uh, to, to resist totalizing thought, and a kind of freedom that is brought about by what Pursuance calls methodological mildness. You're yeah? not going overboard with one thing or another, but having a kind of a, like a, a range of things and having a somewhat sort of mild and protective kind of attitude towards you know, how we're uh, presenting uh, the things in a way that opens people to the world, but still you know, keeps that autonomy and freedom close to the immediate political demands. Because if it, it's not, then you will get policy selected evidence if, it's, if we are not closed to society in, a res in some respect, yeah? So Bista says that your education has three objectives. Qualification, yeah? This is the one thing that even the Republicans in the 2017 Pew survey agree that, you know, it's good for produce, we are good at producing qualifications. It's for socialization. And I'm saying that the socialization that we have under termite transdisciplinarity is a bit problematic because we are socializing people to become these neoliberal subjects, the competitive subjects. And um, the, it's pretty harsh. And you know, this particular kind of becoming a subject, this being socialized into you know, just being an instrument for the economy is also painful. And 
it's foreclosing. It does not allow people to do this third educational aim, which Bista points to, which is about creating and enabling people to grow up in the world as people who relate to the world, persons who relate to the world cognitively and socially. And this is what he calls subjectification, forming an ecological uh, view of their place in the world. That is not an egological, yeah? It's not just all about them. It's about how they relate to the world as persons. So just to finish off, I see I'm in fairly good time. That's not too bad. Um, we've seen in recent years a lot of different kinds of gestures which are going beyond our public institutions, educational institutions as we know them, and science as we know it, and research as we know it. Uh, that perhaps we are already looking to some, be including something in the middle that we don't really know yet or fully recognize yet, but it's different. And a lot of people have been referring to, seen huge references to this work, uh, the undercommons, these fugitive spaces that we can steal from the public institutions, you know. But my argument is they're still ours. We don't have to steal them because we belong to them and they belong to us. Okay? They haven't been, if they haven't been completely privatized and taken by the termites, eaten by the termites and turned into the huge big termite mound. Not everybody feels that it's, it's worth rescuing or worth re, re, revitalizing the, what's been left after the termites have had their day. And I, you know, there's some work uh, by my uh, good friend and colleague, Vanessa Andriotti, that, that points to the need for many aspects of our world to actually leave and get finished. And we will have to look after this, this ending of, of universities, knowledge, science, institutions that are fundamentally colonial in their modernity. But still in the meantime, you know, I'm not completely with the undercommons and the hospicing movement myself. I think I'm more in this other space of emergence, which is around experiments with inquiry, peer production, involving different kinds of people, different places, um, uh, somehow inhabiting places in a different way, um, in a way that's convivial, hospitable, uh, places where we can still think together and come together through collective intelligence assemblies, facilitated assemblies, through living labs, um, through different kinds of creative and activist work and social innovation. Lovely new book by another colleague, Anke Schwitte, on creative universities. Through this opening world of research and education, uh, open research, open educational research, open education, open science. And, the possibility then of, you know, maybe alternative universities, building alternative communities, locally and globally. So yeah, I think I'm done. And I'm more or less on time. And um, thank you so much, Sue, for that um, interesting presentation. Um, I think we have a comment here on the chat section. Um, Caroline says, this is so true. Ethics and values are the starting point of all. It is fascinating, it is fascinating, assuming your ability to weave all these complex ideas together. Many things to grapple with in order to resist neoliberalism and defending our knowledge creation institution. Um, I actually have a question for you, Sue. Um, yes, um I understand that um, you know within the research community and within the academy, there's been quite a lot of discourse around decolonization and, 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 and. And you made an example about South Africa with the Fees Must Fall movement, but could we really realize 
decolonization in our lifetime? Could we really do that? Considering the fact that, well, I'm just speaking for myself in my own context, which is here in South Africa, the higher education system as a whole is funded by the state. And higher education, which is individual universities are dependent on the state to function. And higher education's role in all policy documents would say it's for public good, right? So it should be an engaged university. And I think the university as a whole has been the institution that has been calling for decolonization. Mm -hmm. But how is it that the university, how can it be able to realize this uh, aspiration of decolonization, whereas it would seem that the state has different priorities. Because remember, higher education depends on the state. So how do we how, how do we clarify that that relationship and how do we navigate around working together with the state to make that possible? Because it would seem that the state has has something else in mind because if they really thought that this was a priority, it would have started already. We would be learning in our own native languages, for instance, which is the decolonization of pedagogy, but none of that is happening. So how do we make it a reality? Wow, Kama, I mean, that's pretty uh, tough question, isn't it? And it really comes you know, with this moment where we have already had these termites kind of eating away at this public purpose of the university. So when you talk about different priorities, the university has different, the state has different priorities and the university has different priorities. So I think what I want to kind of maybe just focus on is this, this, this idea of investing in the mission. So, you know, to get the state, call on the state, insist to the state that really it's a necessity to invest in the public mission. And that may mean that it's not going to get exactly what it wants when it wants, because part of the public mission includes this educative mission. It includes this uh, uh, creation and, and fostering and, and maintenance of this holding environment where we can really teach people. We can really do our research. We can really um, have some of the time and space that's been invested in to really come up with, you know, something with people. And that's not the quick returns that the state wants. Um, and I do think that this ratings path that the state has imposed, yeah, I think the South African state has quite restrictive demands on its scholars. You know, the, 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 the national uh, research infrastructure and, and accountability mechanisms are very demanding on South African scholars um, to produce these highly ranked impact, uh, scientific impact, journal articles and publish a lot rather than to, to do the other work because the publications are one type of product, but they're just one type of product. They're not all the work. So I think we need to work more on defining what we mean by an excellent or a good quality higher education, which does these different uh, tasks um, and is allowed to do these different tasks, but we need to come up with a way of evaluating and telling the story of what these tasks are and how we are going to know if we are doing them well compared to badly. Now, this is a huge task and it is about reformatting, you know, the, the, the structure of thinking and also of behavior, because that's how we've got dragged away by the metric tide. It's not an easy thing. It's been, you know, instrumentalized in every and institutionalized in, 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 in so many different procedures and, and judgments of what we do. So I do think that that's, that's really one of the first steps I'd like you to see investment in mission, understanding both you know, what is higher and what is educational in the mission and uh, uh, being committed to changing the way we do things because 
we, if we don't change the way we do things, having different commitments and mission, it's not gonna work. We're not gonna be able to operationalize a different mission. So yeah, I, it's, you asked a very important and terribly difficult question, Kama. Okay, all right. Um, Caroline, you had your video on. Maybe you wanna ask to her question now. Yes, thank, thank you. Hello, I was, um, hi. Um, you know, I, I, I'm grateful. This is an amazing, so um, I think Paul is saying, when I grow up, I want to think like Sue. <laughs> <laughs> I follow his idea. I'll pay him his bribe later. Well, you know what I think here is that in our, you know, what the, the, the question that was just asked is absolutely vital. But I think that instead of despairing, I think, for example, I'm thinking myself when I'm doing a research project, other ways of knowing need to be integrated. We need to transcend this idea that we're going to research some kind of community. No, we're going to, we, the thing is we need to core design what is needed to be researched by the community what is so working with the community and then i also think that that knowledge that is created talking about your ethics as as methods or as i call it um needs to then inspire us in the co-creation of that knowledge product mm -hmm. of that research so it's not my knowledge it's our knowledge mm -hmm. but again that that needs a lot, it first needs to be, and I, I'm working on this, um, trying to find a way in which a research proposal is sound when I'm saying that the impact is not gonna be set by me, I'm gonna set it together with the community that we're doing this work. What is impact for them, not for me? Mm -hmm. And I need to learn what really impacts their life. It's not the mm -hmm. same that impacts my life, definitely not. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I think what I'm trying to say here is that we, there is a way, I think, that if we want to, maybe we're not teaching in the languages of, of the different communities, and I agree, and, and, and I'm, I, you know, I don't think it is the right thing, and, I'm, and, I, and I feel, I feel it because I, I, I feel it. But what I think here, maybe that is the next step. Mm -hmm. Maybe the co-creation of knowledge can happen with indigenous or rural communities, and then that knowledge really that is created there is a knowledge that is weaved amongst the differences that yeah. are involved in the research. And then the next step maybe is, okay, that is the knowledge that is gonna be taught. And, and, and maybe maybe if, if, if we find a way, maybe we can co-teach this, given all these blended experiences that we have had. So maybe we can design a teaching experience, product of that research, where the teachers are, all of those who are in the space of research. Maybe some people don't want to do any teaching and they are happy to just have, part, you know, not everyone wants to do everything. And I'm imagining, I'm, I'm envisioning a new utopia that I don't know if it exists, but I definitely going to fight for it. Yeah, and I think having the, envisaging the utopia, the, the, the envisioning the utopia, because I think that we need to see the dystopia. Oh, I don't yeah. think we can, we can, you know, we can't just, um, ignore that munching sound that we can hear all the time chomp 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 chomp, chomp you know as Absolutely. it's eating up the little you know the chair that you're sitting on and the table that your computer is on and that you know whatever the mental furniture that is holding up the place and the mental walls and ceiling and the you know we don't want yeah. all that you know because it's getting fairly you can it's you know the the more hollow it becomes the louder the munching sound Absolutely. becomes right yeah but I do think, yeah, this, this, what's the achievable utopia? What's the real utopia that you can think of, you know, which is not the utopia, the not place, but the utopia, the good place. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And Ruha Benjamin talks about the utopia as this place of struggle together, imagining a future that is possible. And uh, um, what's his name? N. Elling or Wright or O'Neill Wright? He talks Eric about Olin Wright. Eric Olin Wright. Um, I mean, he, he passed away already, but his work is incredibly strong and, um, and critical realism, which is what I, in a way, my philosophy of science, at least not, I'm not, you know, it's, it's an interesting philosophy of science to think mm -hmm. about. And one of the things there is how can we arrive to this place where emancipation is possible? Thank you. I'm, I'm going to shut up. 
yeah, yeah. But I, I just also want to um, to to reflect back on Kama's point about language because I don't think I answered that. Yeah, that we have to become more multilingual because you cannot have a polylog in a mono language. And the great thing is that it's actually, it is possible. Translanguaging theory, you know, like this is really amazing translanguaging theory because it, it tells you that you may imagine that you can't understand because it's a different language. But what if you just thought the opposite? They're saying something in a language, you're saying something in a language, it's language, you can make yourself understood. It's possible that, you know, mutual understanding could jump over the boundary if you had the right kind of stuff in the boundary objects. So that's a kind of an interesting possibility, but it means that we must recognize and honor the different languages that knowledge is created in and not wish them away and not wash them away. I see Paul as a question there. Do you want to ask it? Paul? Hi, Dina. Hi, Sue. Uh, I'm Hi, just yeah. wondering, uh, I, is it possible to work for change, to do change, to really, really be in acting change on, without hope? What is the role of hope and what is the basis for hope in your activism and your scholarship? Oh, gosh, what a hard question. I know, you know, we've been thinking about this for a a long time and I suppose a lot of what we do is driven by um, effective states you know how we how we feel about things and a lot of what is bad in the world is happening because of you know cynicism is about the abandonment of hope so I think one of the main troubles that we are faced with today is epistemic cynicism when people will say and do anything just to just to get i don't know ahead but you know they don't really believe in that cause but it's just you know convenient and i think cynicism is the opposite of hope right so i don't think we can do without hope because we need something as the bulwark against cynicism I think that to me, cynicism is the worst thing that can happen. You know, when we, knowledge just becomes whatever. So, you know, you'll have, you know, people who are professors of universities going out on the street and telling people that if you wear a mask, you, you're, you are gonna lower your IQ. And if you give people vaccinations against COVID, they're gonna kill the old people. And you know, you, people, you've got people who are saying and, and doing really harmful, maleficent things. So I think that hope is part of that, part of what that isn't. You know, if that makes sense. <laughs> Hope is part of that orientation towards the possibility that cynicism isn't all, the only show in town. Um, yeah, I think that's what hope is, is that there are other shows in town. Don't go to that show. Um, okay. But I, 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 I'm sorry, I know I'm the facilitator, but this this presentation was so interesting, but I have one, one last question for you, Sue. And you just said something about people will do or say anything. And it just reminded me, um, because on in your presentation, you mentioned something um, about neoliberalism. Mm. And um, you, you also mentioned that you know, especially here in South Africa, there's quite a lot, uh, it, it's, there are tough, really tough requirements and there's this obsession with ratings and, and research output and, and I recently read um, an article by a lady called um, Joanne Oravec and she wrote this article back in 2017 and it's titled The Manipulation of Scholarly Rating and Measurement Systems. So constructing excellence in an era of academic stardom. So don't you think then that it is neoliberalism that has created this problem now? Because how can we ever delineate between 
real, authentic research. And on the other end, we have now this thing of the manipulation of ratings and academic fraud, mm -hmm. which speaks to ethics. Mm -hmm. So how can we ever be taken seriously as the academy as a whole if we are competing with neoliberalism and people doing all these things? Can we ever then rely on research and how can we tell what what is real research and what isn't? Mm -hmm. I think what's really at the key to answering this question is, you know, Wendy Brown's insight that neoliberalism isn't just about the economy. It isn't just about finance or corporations. Neoliberalism is first and foremost about the creation of a political subjectivity. Okay, so this is the thing that Gerbi is called subjectivation. And it creates in the people this idea that your only existence in the world is, is down to competing. And, 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 and you view yourself not as a person, but as a unit of human capital. So you just accumulate your human capital and go out in this kind of war of competition with other human capitals in a sort of hunger games of human capitals. But the, you know, so the op opposite of that is to have education, which allows, and science, that allows us different forms of subjectivation, forming a relationship with our society and with others. That is not just about human capital or competition, because it's compete and die in this neoliberal subjectivity. So I think this is really the key insight, is that this is really about democracy, not as a, just a system, but democracy is how it's instantiated in the person's relationship with other persons. Yeah, so we are kind of now in a kind of, she calls it living in the ruins of neoliberalism because neoliberalism is hungry and wasteful. So if we had to survive and, 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 and sustain ourselves as societies in these difficult times, I think we need to find a subject, a, a form of subjectification that is different so that we become subjects who are responsible to each other as people who create knowledge and who teach and learn from each other. So that would be my perspective on it. But maybe people might find that a bit <laughs> radical, I don't know. But yeah, I think that new, it's yeah. really <laughs> countering sure. that neoliberal, that conception of the neoliberal subject. Because, you know, as long as we are, are buy into that termite transdisciplinarity of the neoliberal subject, we will never get out of our problem. Uh, uh. I see there's another hand up somewhere. Okay. I can't see. Okay. You can go, Alex. Hello and uh, thank you, Sue. First of all, I'm I'm always tickled when I see somebody expressing so much more clearly things I've been trying to articulate in in writing and talks for years, and then I encounter such a clear formulation. I'm like, God, I wish I could say that way. <laughs> um, and harking into that, I have when you when you just mentioned Wendy Brown's uh, ruins aspect, I've been thinking about Anna Tsing. And this idea of living in ruins, blasted landscape, but also creating a garden of patches, so to speak. And and for me, this is a is a lovely metaphor that goes also to the question of multilingualism, for example, mm. because I had to remember I come from Germany originally, and in certain, especially language related uh, disciplines and fields, are called orchid subjects mm -hmm. in the university. And the question there is always like, oh, you know, with regard to employability, should we keep them, et cetera, et cetera. And more and more, I'm thinking about this garden of patches and whether or not in higher education, uh, a different way of thinking about us as gardeners is not called for, but not gardeners in the colonial botanical garden, but gardeners who together work with other gardeners and foresters as members and parts of the forest and the garden, living, living in this garden of patches. Um, and instead of doing a policing work with regard to which weeds and insects we let in, um, we, we think about 
this as nourishment. And this comes with a specific responsibility, for example, when we, uh, to, to go to Carolyn's point, for example, when we have research grants that we are evaluating, or when we're working as editors, um, these aspects of what used to be called academic citizenship, or is still called academic citizenship, are often conducted with, a, I think, a neoliberal mindset, such as rather than saying, oh, here is an article or a grant that uses decolonial thinking rather than, people are not saying, oh, I'm against it, but they're saying like, well, I have to be accountable as reviewer to the funders, to the state, and, and not say, okay, I'm taking a risk on that. As an editor saying like, why don't I encourage a group of authors to put the, uh, even in the traditional neoliberal system, but why don't I encourage the authors to put the PhD student or the postdoc as first author, mm -hmm. if they probably also have done the work? Why don't people do, do these kinds of things? I, I do not re really know, in a sense, how to encourage that, and that would be my question. How can we really encourage people to, to rethink their role, not as po police officers, as gatekeepers, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, but to think of them as more holistic, integrated gardeners into a garden of patches. Mm. Well, certainly, I mean, it's a lot to think about there, Alex, you know. Um, uh, Anna Singh and this idea of the patches, I mean, even that, that book, The Mushroom at the End of the World is, is a wonderful book. It's a fantastic book. And it's that book that make, you know, kind of opens up little vistas, clearings, patches, as you say, kind of illuminates them. But even that book is not too clear about, because these ruins are already there. So the question is like, you know, just inhabit them at the edges. Do your salvage, your cap, you know, at the edges, because that's how this is working, you know, that, but it can become a form of salvage capitalism too. So this is what can happen when we make alternative spaces, but we still have this neoliberal subjectivation, which is forcing us to instrumentalize and purpose those spaces with a capitalist neoliberal lo logic. So the only way I think you can do it is to decommodify it with, you know, generosity. So those who are like me, who have tenure, who have, you know, job, who have pay, you know, that means we should do what we can for to advance the cause of those colleagues who are in the precarious situation, in the, the less stable situation, and to have solidarity with, you know, those who are quite rightly, you know, demanding less unreasonable terms of employment and, 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 and work, because we are all living and working through an era of intense overwork as academics too, which is part of this careless university, uh, this wasteful university. So, I do think that there are things we can do. And over the last, since the lockdown, especially I've experimented a lot with um, alternative gatherings and spaces. And I think Akas Africa could be a space like this. Um, another one that I uh, participate in quite a bit is Convivial Thinking Collaborative. And it's just a very loose collaborative. It's exactly like this mushroomy type of network. Um, and in that, I think that people like me have a responsibility to um, keep things going, to help with writing, to co-write uh, and be the last author, um, and to try and understand what other people are writing about. And um, yeah, and to do things and get things out there. Uh, so I do, th I do feel that, you know, I felt incredibly, um, sustained by these very informal networks like this Arcus network here that we are at today and the convivial thinking network and I think that the patches that these provide have been very convivial hospitable and um, they are these educative spaces you know that I think are you know open to the world but they're kind of you know closed to commodification and you know society in that way they're not you know close to society as the world but 
Does that make sense? Uh, um, Lorraine in the comments says, it is so difficult to resist or work against the neoliberal press pressures mm -hmm. in higher education because it is so constant. And I, I really do agree with her on that one. Um, sometimes it just, yeah, maybe there is hope. Yeah, I, I really think, you know, you know, my friend and colleague Chris Brink is right, you know, that it, it is about the battle for the soul, your soul as an academic and for the soul of the university. And, you know, I suppose that's a sociological question. It goes back to, you know, the key sociologists like Durkheim is that, you know, basically what do we do as individuals in a society is we, we create the soul of society through our actions. And he calls them rights. You know, they're not just ordinary actions. They're actions that constitute meaning in the world. And so you're like, you know, when I come here and I do this, you know, I imbue it with a certain meaning. Yeah, I kind of, it, that resists neoliberalism that, you know, disses it and calls it out for what I think it is. Uh, and, you know, pay attention to that munching, crunching sound that as it's chewing away at the leg of your chair. Um, and, and, you know, call attention to it, call it out, say its name, and then, you know, say your name, say this thing, say what it is, this, this other values, other future, other higher education, other space, other scholarship, other research, other community that you know you you want to bring into existence because it is your world. It's not theirs. They're not entitled to have it. That's that's my you know resistant interdisciplinary background. You know saying that that there are so many people are saying this. You took this from us and it's not yours. And so we have to occupy it and take it back. So that's kind of my view, which is less mild. I think, you know, Alex's view was a little bit more methodologically mild you know, with, the, with the patches and the, the salvage, you know, whereas I think sometimes maybe, you know, I could be, I could go for the fierce option even. All right, um, I think now, um, that comment um, brings us to the end of our session today. Um, Jenny, over to you. Thanks, Alma. Um, I actually saw that Michael Ocherepo managed to join us. Um, I was just wondering if you wanted to say hello or say anything at this point. <laughs> hi, hi to everybody. No, because I, I went teaching and uh, I came at the very end of it listening to Sue and uh, uh, those very convincing um, uh, subjects. So thank you so much. It's nice to be part of, of this group. Thank you. Well, Great nice to, to see you, Michael. Thank you so much. Yeah. OK, so um, it just falls to me to really um, give a vote of thanks, firstly, to Sue for um, firstly, her amazing contributions to this network, the Acres Africa Network. I feel like I think she's almost always at any event we have, she's always there <laughs> and engaged and it's just wonderful to have her. Um, and then for gracing us with her presence today and giving us this amazing talk, there's, you know, you hear the word transdisciplinarity and you're like, okay, I know what that is. And apparently I don't, so <laughs> it's been very educative. Um, so thank you so much, Sue. I hope we'll have you again for something soon. Um, and then thank you to Dina and Michael and Andre in his Andre in his absence um, for all their work in terms of like instigating this network and um, the behind the scenes work, their intellectual work on that. That's been amazing as well. And then for my personal side, thanks to my team for their work on behind the scenes on the seminar and on in terms of their work related to the network as well. Um, Hama today for facilitating um, uh, Anele for all her logistics work and Amy for the design work on the invitations. And she'll also be <laughs> video editing this, um, this presentation for distribution later. So please be on the lookout for that link. Um, we will send it to everyone who RSVP'd and we'll also um, post it on the ACOS Africa website. So if you want to um, get connected with us to see what news comes up from, from our network, please um, go to acosafrica.com and you can subscribe. 
I mean, have a look around. <laughs> um, yeah, and then thank you to everyone who made it today. We always appreciate that and for the wonderful engagements. Um, to all the network members, some of whom are here today and some of whom couldn't make it for all their part in growing this network and creating the space for rethinking higher education, thinking about the university critically, thinking about alternatives. So we really, really appreciate that. I think I have covered everyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I have forgotten anyone, then thanks to them in their absentia. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And um, I hope you'll join us again next time we have something in the similar vein. Um, and yeah, <laughs> have a wonderful evening or whatever it is, wherever you are. Thank you, colleagues.